In today's video, we are going to take a look at the full life of one of the greatest characters in the Wheel of Time, a man of many names and titles. In the Borderlands, he was called the Uncrowned. He was also known as the Lord of the Seven Towers, Lord of the Lakes, True Blade of Malkir, Defender of the Wall of First Fires, Bearer of the Sword of the Thousand Lakes, Daishan, King of Malkir, and Annaline. One man alone. The Wheel of Time has seven spokes, each representing an age. Lan was born in 953 NE, which is the 953rd year of the New Era, which takes place at the very end of the Third Age. Lan was 45 years old when he and Warren went to the Two Rivers. Lan's mother was Eliana T. Arathar Mandragoran of House Arathar. She married Al Akir Mandragoran. They were the king and queen of Malkir, and they had one son, Lan. Unfortunately, Malkir was overrun by the Blight. As Malkir was falling, the king and queen had Lan brought to them in his cradle. Into his infant hands they placed the sword of the Malkiri kings, a weapon made by Aes Sedai during the War of Power, the War of Shadow that brought down the Age of Legends. They anointed his head with oil, naming him Daishan, a diademed battlelord, and consecrated him as the next king of the Malkiri. And in his name, they swore the ancient oath of the Malkyri kings and queens, to stand against the shadow so long as iron is hard and stone abides, to defend the Malkyri so long as one drop of blood remains, to avenge what cannot be defended. Eliana placed a locket around her son's neck bearing images of her and his father, and he was also given the ancient ring of the Malkyri kings. Twenty of the best swordsmen were chosen from the king's bodyguard and given the command to carry the child to Fal Morin, Shinar. Meanwhile, his mother and father were killed, the Malkieri died, and the seven towers were broken. Only five of the twenty bodyguards reached Fal Morin alive, every man wounded, but they had the child unharmed. From the cradle, they taught him all they knew. He learned weapons as other children learned toys, and the Blight as other children their mother's garden. Lan began sword training at 8, and he was given his first sword at just 10. At 15, the 35-year-old Lady Edine Tigamelon Irel became his Carnera, his first lover. A year later, he was given the Hadori headband. Lan was granted a modest estate in Shinar, and he was very learned. He could read Trolloc runes, and he could read and speak the old tongue fluently. Lan became an excellent tracker, and in doing so, he became an expert in hiding his own trail. On top of that, Lan became one of the best swordsmen of the Third Age. Although he had the right to wear a heronmarked blade, he continued to use the simple, unmarked blade of the Malkyrie Kings, a sword that was made with the one power during the War of the Shadow in the Second Age. It was slightly curved, had a single edge, never needed to be sharpened, and could not be broken. The oath sworn over his cradle was graven in his mind. There was nothing left to defend, but he could avenge. Land denied his titles, yet in the Borderlands he was called the Uncrowned, and if he ever raised the Golden Crane of Malkier, an army would come to follow, but he would not lead men to their deaths. In the Blight, Land courted death as a suitor courts a maiden, but he would not lead others to it. By his mid-twenties, only one of the twenty men who had carried Lan to safety was still alive, Bukama. Lan and Bukama fought for the Great Coalition in the Aiel War. The final battle is formerly known as the Battle of the Shining Walls, but it had many other names. Some of those who fought in that battle called it the Blood Snow. Lan led almost five hundred men during that battle. At the end of the war, he was confronted and outnumbered by an Aiel army on their way home, but they didn't fight. The Aiel raised their spears and lowered them as one. Then the Aiel shouted out a single word, on a line. The best translation of the old tongue that Lan could come up with was one man alone. With the war done, Lan felt the pull of home sharply. Nothing remained to be defended, only a nation to avenge, and he had trained to that from his first step. With his mother's gift at his throat, and his father's sword in his hand. With the ring branded on his heart, he had fought from his 16th name day to avenge Malkir, but he had never led men into the Blight. Bukama had ridden with him and others, but he would not lead men there. 
That war was his alone. All he wanted was a return to the Blight and no encounters with Aes Sedai. But then he met Moraine. The very first time that they met, Moraine tried to sneak up on Lan and steal his sword, but he was too quick and he threw her into a pond. That night, she threw half of the pond on him. Lan agreed to escort her to Chachin and she tortured him the entire way with pranks of fire ants, fleas, and black flies since he had never apologized for throwing her into the pond, since he was arrogant, and since he did not believe she was Aes Sedai or treat her with the respect of one. Little did he know, Moiraine had decided that she would bond him the first day that they had met, once she determined that he wasn't a dark friend. When they got to Chachin, Moiraine met up with Swan and searched for the Dragon Reborn. Meanwhile, Lan visited his first lover, Lady Edine Arell, since she had raised the golden crane in his name. Edine wanted Lan to marry her daughter, but he was not keen to do that. Moreover, there were dark friends at the palace, and they killed her daughter. Another dark friend killed Bukama, the last of the twenty men who had carried the infant Lan to safety as Malkir fell. More than ever before, Lan had become one man alone. But not for long. Lan helped Moiraine fight the Dark Friends, and afterwards, he rode off on his final journey to the Blight alone. But Moiraine caught up to him, and she told him that she wanted him to be her warder. Moiraine told Lan everything, from the Black Aja to Guitar's foretelling of the Dragon Reborn. She explained to Lan that the war she was fighting against the Shadow was the same war that he was fighting, and unlike his quest to avenge Malkier alone, her quest to find the Dragon Reborn was a war they could win, a war they needed to win or the world would die. For a long time, Lan stood staring north toward the Blight. Then he turned, sword flashing out, sank to his knees, and gave her his oath. And Moiraine bonded him. The one man alone had become two. They spent the next twenty years searching for the Dragon Reborn, and they finally found him in the Two Rivers. Over the course of those 20 years, Lan and Moiraine had been companions in countless battles. He had ridden a horse to death, then run himself to death, carrying her in his arms to Anaya for healing. She had tended his wounds more than once, and he had always said that he was wedded to death. But then he met Nynaeve, and a new bride captured his eyes, and Moiraine wondered if he would still court death so blithely. On their way to the Eye of the World, they camped out in the fallen nation of Malkier, within sight of the Seven Towers, and Nynaeve opened up to Lan about her love for him. Lan told her that he would hate the man she chose because he was not him, and love him if he made her smile. But Lan had a sword that would not break, and a war that would not end, a war he could not win. He told her that no woman deserved the sure knowledge of Widow's Black as a bride price, Nynaeve least of all. Without trying, without even thinking of what she was doing, Nynaeve had put cracks in Lan's walls and seeded those cracks with creepers. Slowly, the creepers had begun to tear down the walls to bear the man within. It all came to a head at the Eye of the World, where they were confronted by two of the Forsaken, and Lan was torn between who to protect, Moiraine or Nynaeve. Afterwards, Lan gave Nynaeve his signet ring, the Ring of the Malkyrie Kings. He told her that if she showed it to any lord in the borderlands, she would have guest right and help if she needed it. If she showed it to a warder, he would give her aid or carry a message to Lan. Lan said to send the ring to him or a message marked with it and he would come to her without delay and without fail. Then he told her that he must go and named her Nynaeve Mashiara, a word that meant beloved of heart and soul, but also a love lost. Lost beyond regaining. At Tiffin's Wells, Moiraine told Lan that she had arranged for his bond to pass to Morel Sedai should anything happen to her. She didn't want him to be surprised, so she warned him that if she were to die, he would feel compelled to seek out Morel immediately. Lan did not appreciate being treated like a pet lapdog that could be passed around. In fact, he got angry at Moiraine for the first time since their bond. But Moiraine had her reasons. Moiraine feared that if she were to die, not even her strongest command would stop him from dying in a useless attempt to avenge her. 
she also did not want him to return to what she considered his equally useless private war in the Blight. So that is why she made plans for his bond to transfer to Morel, but that's not where her plans ended. Morel had promised to pass the bond to another woman once she found one who suited him better. Over the coming year, Landon and Eve reunited for periods of time at Falma and Tyr, but they spent more time apart as Lan remained by Moraine's side. When Lan found out that Nynaeve was secretly planning to go to the dangerous city of Tanchico, he was torn between his love for her and his bond to Moraine. He told Nynaeve that if she were to die, he would not survive long and he offered to go there with her and protect her. But Nynaeve couldn't have that. Nynaeve meant for Lan to be hers, all of him, and she would not have him remembering a broken oath to Moraine. So Nynaeve commanded Lan to stay with Moraine, and he did. They traveled to the Aiel Waste and back to Carrion with Matt, Rand, and Egwene. And that was where Lan, once again, became one man alone. Moraine hurled herself at Lanfear, and they were both swallowed up by the doorframe to Rongril. Lan began to move forward, so Rand channeled and caught Lan in a weave of air, preventing him from following her. Sadly, Lan could no longer feel Moraine's presence. Lan told Rand that he and Moraine could have died 200 times over the past 20 years, that she had known it and so had he, that it had been a good day to die. When he said that, his voice was as hard as it had ever been, but his cold blue eyes were red-rimmed. Rand asked Lan to stay because he valued Lan's counsel and sword training, but Lan told him what Moraine had done, that he was now bonded to Morel and had to go find her. Before he left, he asked Rand to do him a favor. For an instant, his stone face crumpled in anguish. Then it was granted again, and he told Rand to tell Nynaeve that he'd gone to be a Green Sister's lover as well as her sword. He also advised Rand that if he ever loved a woman, to leave her and let her find another, that that would be the best gift he could give her. Peace favor your sword, he said, Tyshar Menetherin, and he rode off. Lan had a long journey ahead of him. He rode across Carrion, Ander, Murindi, and Altara, focused on Morel like an arrow speeding to the target, carving his way through any armed man who stood in his path. But even he could not do that unharmed, so he sustained a number of injuries along the way. When he finally got to her, Morel stared up into his cold blue eyes, and she saw death. The light help her, she thought. How was she ever to keep him alive? In their first two weeks together, Morel and Lan slept together. Morel was of the Green Aja, and she had three other warders. Two of them had belonged to other sisters who had died, and that is one of the reasons why Moraine had chosen her, because Morel had a proven ability twice over of preventing warders from dying. When Egwene found out that Morel was hiding Lan, Morel claimed that she would pass the bond over to Nynaeve as soon as he was safe and as soon as Nynaeve was ready, but... It was clear to Egwene that Lan was not okay, so she came up with another plan. Egwene told Lan that Nynaeve was in need of a warder, that she was in the dangerous city of Ibudar, searching for something that they needed desperately, that the Black Aja and Forsaken would kill her if they found out. Egwene saw the pain in his eyes, and that gave her the confirmation that she had hoped for. Egwene told Lan that she was sending him to Nynaeve to act as her warder. Lan did not hesitate to saddle his horse. Egwene used skimming to drop him off around five or six days out from Ibudar. Meanwhile, Mogedian nearly killed Nynaeve while she was visiting the Atha Amir Mistress of Ships. As the boat sank, Nynaeve did something she had never done before. She fully surrendered to Sidar and finally broke her block. To her surprise, Lan swam down and rescued her. When they got back onto his boat, Nynaeve was furious when she found out that he was bonded to Morel. She told him that Morel was going to give her his bond, that they would be married that very day, and that she would not let him die. Lan remained by Nynaeve's side as they searched for, found, and used the bowl to winds, but that attracted the attention of the Sean Chan, so they fled through a gateway to Camelin. When Rand snuck into the palace to tell Nynaeve about his idea of cleansing Sidene, he pointed out that Lan had not taken his own advice about staying away from the women they loved. Then, things got tense. Lan was concerned about Rand's plan, asking him 
why they wouldn't have cleansed Sidene in the Age of Legends if it could be done, and he warned Rand that he could get Nynaeve hurt in a tone that made it clear he would not allow that. Nevertheless, Nynaeve thought it was a wonderful idea, and they did it. They cleansed Sidene. Afterwards, they traveled to Tyr to recover. They were attacked by a large force of Murdral and Trollocs. They fought them off with the help of Loghain and the Aes Sedai and Asherman he had brought, but it had been a close call. That attack convinced Lan that the last battle was coming soon. Lan warned Nynaeve that Shadowspawn could be moving down through the Blight while Rand was wasting time dancing with the Shaunchan for a truce. Nynaeve knew that Lan was envisioning Shadowspawn moving down through Malkier, and she realized that Lan had to go there. She also knew that he would refuse to raise the Malkier banner because he didn't want to lead the last of his countrymen to their debts, but he was perfectly willing to ride to that same death himself in the name of honor. She wanted to cry, to scream at him that he was a fool, that his place was with her, not dying in a futile private war with the Shadow, only she could not say any of that. Bond or no bond, she knew he was torn inside, torn between his love for her and his duty, torn and bleeding as surely as if he had been stabbed with a sword, and she could not add to his wounds, but she could try to make sure he survived. Nynaeve told Lan that she would take him to the Borderlands via a gateway if he promised to go to Falmoran before he entered the Blight, that if anyone wanted to ride with him, he let them. Lan realized that her goal was to drop him off and then gateway ahead of him in hopes of recruiting other men to his side, and he was right, but he underestimated her. Lan asked Nynaeve how far south in Shinar she was going to leave him, but she didn't answer. Nynaeve could have lied since she hadn't taken the three oaths of the Aes Sedai, but Egwene wanted her to behave as though she had. So Nynaeve didn't answer his question, and he didn't catch that, and he swore to her anyway. Nynaeve gave him a goodbye kiss in front of others because she knew that there would be no time for that later. Instead of bringing Lan to the southern point of Shinar as he had expected, Nynaeve opened up a gateway all the way out at World's End in Saldea. That was the furthest spot from Shinar that you could get while still being in the Borderlands as she had promised. Nynaeve told Lan to remember his oath to her because she surely would. Then she dug her heels in her mare's flanks and bolted back through the open gateway. Nynaeve traveled ahead of land to the Queenslands in Kakakun, Saldea. She showed a merchant named Wylan Aldragarin the gold signet ring of Melchior, and she told him that her name was Nynaeve Tialmira Mandragorin, and she wanted him to send out a message. The message was that her husband rides from World's End toward Torwin's Gap, towards Tarmin Gaiden. Would he ride alone? Nynaeve visited a few other towns before returning to Tyr to keep an eye on Olivia around Rand, and her plan worked. After she left, Master Aldragorin asked two other men if they still remembered who they were, if they remembered their blood, and if they would ride with him for Tarwin's Gap. For a moment, he thought neither man would speak, but then Gorinellan was on his feet, tears glistening his eyes. The golden crane flies for Tarmin Gaiden. He said softly. The golden crane flies for Tarmin Gaiden, Madigan shouted, leaping up so fast he overturned his chair. Laughing, Aldragorin joined them, all three shouting at the top of their lungs that the golden crane flies for Tarmin Gaiden. As Lamb began his journey to Falmorn, he thought how this road had stretched before him for a long time, how he had turned away from it twenty years ago, agreeing to follow Moraine, but he'd always known he'd return. This was what it meant to bear the name of his fathers, the sword on his hip and the hadori on his head. Riding to his death didn't pain him, but knowing that Nynaeve feared for him did hurt, very badly. As Lan made his way across Saldea, he was first joined by a man named Bulin who had come to know Lan twenty years prior when he was just a messenger boy. Bulin told Lan that he had learned the sword, but Lan tried to deny Bulin since Bulin was not mounted and Lan had only promised Nynaeve that he would let people ride with him. As Lan rode away, Buon called out that his father had been Malkieri, that his father had said that someday they would fight for the Golden Crane. His father had died when he was five, and all that Buon had left of him was a Hadori, but 
tradition said that someone had to give him the right to don it. He told Lan that he would stand against the darkness, and he referred to Lan as his king, asking if he could fight by his side. Lan realized that Aes Sedai might wiggle around their promises, but that did not give him the right to do the same. He was a man of honor, and he could not deny Bulan. However, Lan told Bulan that they would ride anonymously, that they would not raise the golden crane, and Bulan was to tell no one who he was. Bulan agreed, so Lan told Bulan to join him and wear the Hidori with pride. And the one became two. After traveling for a few weeks as two, mainly at night on back roads, they passed by an inn. Three men outside got on their horses and followed them. Two of those men wore the Hadori and Lan knew them. He told them that he was not raising the golden crane and commanded them to turn and go back, but the third man pointed out that Lan was no longer his captain, so he didn't have to obey his orders. They joked that they would obey a king if there had been one there, and Lan countered that there could be no king of a fallen people, no king without a kingdom. He warned them that his road led to death, and they laughed it off, saying that death was lighter than a feather, and the two had become five. In eastern Candor, Lan noticed that Nazar was tucking a brilliant white flag of the golden crane into one of his saddlebags. Then, he noticed that their camp had more tents, and there were eight more men there, including the first three men who had heard Nynaeve's message. On top of that, two dozen wagons approached. Lan made them all swear to not reveal who he was or send word to anyone else, and they all did, but the five had become dozens. It would stop there, he thought. Elsewhere, Nynaeve was tested and formally raised to Aes Sedai. Afterwards, she thanked Morel for having saved Lan and forced her to transfer his water bond. Lan could feel Nynaeve's passion and kindness through the bond, and it felt remarkable. When Lan's caravan got to Silverwall Keeps, there were thousands of people waiting for him. It was a sight that would have made Bukama cry. He had thought the Malkiri gone as a people, broken, shattered, absorbed by other nations. Yet, here they were, gathering at the faintest whisper of a call to arms. Taishar Malkier, a man cried as Lan's group passed. The call went up a dozen, two dozen times as they saw his Hidori. Lan still felt that he must deny them, but each call of Taishar Melchior made him want to sit up straighter. Each call seemed to strengthen him and push him forward. A young prince of Kandor noticed Lan from a window of a keep and ran down in excitement, telling Lan that he had heard that the golden crane had been raised. Lan once again said that the golden crane had not been raised, that his plan was to ride alone. Prince Kazel said, Of course. I would like to ride alone with you. May I? Burn that woman, Lan thought as he heard a call being raised through the fortress. He'd been outmaneuvered. Curse Nynaeve, he thought. And bless her too. Lan sent a sense of love and frustration to her through the bond. And then, with a deep sigh, he gave in. The golden crane flies for Tarman Gaiden, Lan said softly. Let any man or woman who wishes to follow join it and fight. He closed his eyes as the call went up. It soon became a cheer, then a roar. By the time they made it to Tarwin's Gap, Lan had an army of 12,000. But on the other side, there was a Trolloc army of at least 150,000. Lan thought to himself that normally men held their side at Tarwin's Gap, but Lan could not do that. He had come to attack to ride for Malkier. Kaisel told Lan that it was fitting that they should strike there, that it would show the shadow that they would not be beaten down and cower, that it was Lan's land. My land, he thought, nudging Mandarb forward. I am Al-Lan Mandragoran, Lan bellowed, Lord of the Seven Towers, Defender of the Walls of First Fires, Bearer of the Sword of the Thousand Lakes. I was once named on a line, but I reject that title for I am alone no more. Fear me, shadow, fear me and know. I have returned for what is mine. I may be a king without a land, but I 
I'm still a king. A cheer rose behind him as he raised his sword, sent a powerful sensation of love to Nynaeve, and kicked Mandarb into a gallop. They were 12,000 strong, but they charged a force of at least 150,000. This day will be remembered in honor, Lan thought, galloping forward. The last charge of the Golden Crane. The fall of the Malkyrie. The end had come, but they would meet it with swords raised. Lan's forces seized the gap with their initial charge, but over time, they lost half their forces, so Lan organized a retreat. His plan was to regroup and attack one last time as the Trollocs passed through the gap. Lan did not expect to survive. He merely wanted to deliver as much damage as possible to the Shadow with one last charge on the open plain. Lan tried to project confidence to Nynaeve in case he reached her. Pride in his men, love for her. He wished deeply for those to be the last things she remembered of him. As Lan sounded the attack, a dozen gateways opened and charging horsemen burst forth with lances leveled. In seconds, his charge of 6,000 had become a 100,000, including Ashraman. Lan saw a last stand that he never thought he could win become a promising fight and he couldn't help himself. He didn't just smile, he laughed. They raised the banner high and Malkier lived another day. Elaine sent Lord Agamar and the other Borderland monarchs to help Lan hold the gap as long as possible, and all of the Borderland monarchs agreed to fight beneath the banner of Malkier. Lan's army held the Trollocs back with two days of grueling battle. Unfortunately, Bulan died. Bulan had been the first Malkieri to return to Malkier's king, so Lan asked Narishma to open a gateway and bring Bulan someplace cold so that they could find a proper resting place for him when the war was done and Malkier was reclaimed. Lan thanked Bulan for having not given up on him, then took Bulan's Hidori and wrapped it around the hilt of his sword so that Bulan could continue to fight. The Trollocs were joined by as many as two dozen Dreadlords, so Lan finally agreed with Agamar that they should abandon Malkier. Admitting it felt like a knife twisting inside him, but he would do it. The gap was lost. Lan's army burned fields and cities as they retreated south. On their way, Rand visited Lan and gave him two crowns that his smiths had made from old drawings, the crown of the Malkier king and another for Nynaeve. Rand told Lan that he had ever been a king, that Elaine had taught Rand how to rule, but Lan had taught him how to stand. Lan's army's retreat was long and hard. They burnt Faldara and Falmoran, but after four days, it was time to start hitting the shadow back. With the help of some reinforcement channelers, they hit the Trollocs hard. Lan thought how the shadow had taken Malkier from him twice now, how the shadow would never be able to taste his sense of defeat, his sense of loss at leaving his homeland again, this time by choice. But by the light, he could bring them close to it, and his sword through their chest would do that best. During that fight, Lan defeated two Murdral at once. Every evening, it became a tradition for Lan's men to toast the fallen. One night, Lan spoke to his horse, Mandarb. Lan told Mandarb that they would rest soon, that they'd reclaim Malkir and make a home once the shadow was defeated, that Mandarb would have children to ride on his back, that he could spend his days in peace, eating apples and having his pick of mares. It had been a very long time since Lan had thought of the future with anything resembling hope. Strange to find it now, in this place, in this war. He was a hard man. At times, he felt he had more in common with rocks and the sand than he did with the men who laughed together beside the fire. That was what he'd made of himself. It was the person he needed to be a person who could someday journey toward Malkir and uphold the honor of his family. Randall Thor had begun to crack that shell, and Nynaeve's love had ripped it apart completely. Lord Baldir warned Lan that Algamar had been making mistakes, and Lan eventually concluded that Algamar had been under compulsion. Unfortunately, the Borderlanders were crushed due to Algamar's mistakes, and two-thirds of their numbers were killed, and they were not the only ones. Grendel had been manipulating the great captains on the other three battlefronts as well. Elaine sent Loghain and his Ashermen to help Lan's Borderlanders escape, and three of the four forces of light regrouped at the Field of Marilor for one last stand, with Matt in control, since his medallion assured that he could not be compelled. 
they had been bloodied, but not beaten. Knock a man down, and you saw what he was made of. That man might run, but if he didn't, if he stood back up with blood at the corner of his mouth and determination in his eyes, then you knew that man was about to become truly dangerous. At the field of Merlor, the forces of light fought hard, and they fought well. Many brave and selfless acts were done. There were many heroes, but it was not enough to defeat Demodred's forces. When Argonda told Lan that they were doomed, Lan said, If so, we stand atop the high ground and we fight until we die, Kildanan. You surrender when you're dead. Many a man has been given less. Lan prepared for the Shadow's final charge and warned that the next assault would be the worst one and Demodred cried out that this is the end. But Matt hadn't given up and Tuan was prepared to return on Matt's mark. Matt sent Lan to see if there were any healed soldiers in Mayenne who would be able to return to battle and, while he was there, Berylin gave him Galad's medallion. As the Trollocs regrouped to attack, Matt wondered if Lan had come back yet. And then he saw him, a lone horseman on a black stallion charging into the right flank of the Trolloc horde toward Demon Dread. Lan had gone to fight a war on his own. Tam Althor saw Lan charging and yelled out to his two riversmen to prepare to fire. They lit their arrows and sent them flying, a little something to guide Lan's way. Lan did not consider what he was doing. The Void did not allow such things. Some men would call it brash, foolhardy, suicidal, but the world was rarely changed by men who were unwilling to try being at least one of the three. He sent what comfort he could to distant Nynaeve through the bond and prepared to fight. As he approached the Trolloc line, an arrow took out the Trolloc right in front of him, then another and another as an entire rain of burning arrows dropped in front of him. Malkir, he yelled as the Trollocs in front of him dropped and dropped until there were no more. Thank you, Tam, he thought. Since Berylene had given Lan the medallion, he was protected from channeling, but his horse Mandar was not, so Lan threw himself from the saddle, hit the ground at a run, and charged Demon Dread. Throughout the battle, Demon Dread had been determined to fight Luce Theron, but instead he had fought Gawain and Galad. As Lan approached, he began to complain to Luce Theron, but he never got a chance to finish his sentence because Lan came in swinging. They exchanged three quick blows, and the last one caught Demon Dread on the cheek. Who are you? Demon Dread asked. I am the man who will kill you. As Demon Dread launched stones at Lan, he continued to attack, and Demon Dread was surprised by how good Lan was. Once again, he asked, Who are you? I am just a man, Lan whispered. That is all I have ever been. Lan had been fighting for an entire day, so he was tired and injured, whereas Demon Dread was still fresh. As good as Lan was, he knew that Demon Dread was better. Demon Dread began to press forward, cutting Lan multiple times, but Lan thought back to the final lesson that he had taught Ran back at Faldara, the lesson of sheathing the sword. Lan had explained to Rand that there would come a time when you must achieve a goal at all cost, and the only way to achieve that goal would be to allow the sword to be sheathed in your own body. Rand had begun to counter that that was crazy, but Lan cut him off, saying, You'll know when it comes, sheep herder. When the price is worth the gain and there is no other choice left to you. That is called sheathing the sword. Remember it. Rand had thought about sheathing the sword during his fight with High Lord Torak, but the time hadn't been right since Rand had seen Egwene wearing a collar right before the fight and if he died, he couldn't help her. So Rand put aside the thought of sheathing the sword and finished Torak with an aggressive attack. When he went outside, Inktark confessed that he had been a dark friend. He then offered to sacrifice his own life to allow Rand and his friends to escape, and when Rand tried to protest, Inktark told Rand that it was every man's right to choose when to sheathe the sword. Not long after, Rand fought Baalzaman and defeated him by choosing to sheathe the sword. As he fought Demon Dread, Lan realized that the time had come for him to do the same. Demon Dread confidently told Lan that he could not win, to which Lan whispered, You didn't listen to me. As Demon Dread struck, 
Lan saw his opening and lunged forward, placing Demon Dread's sword point against his own side and ramming himself forward onto it. I did not come here to win, Lan whispered, smiling. I came here to kill you. Death is lighter than a feather. Demon Dread's eyes opened wide and he tried to pull back, but it was too late. Lan's sword took him straight through the throat. The world grew dark as Lan slipped backward off the sword. He felt Nynaeve's fear and pain as he did, and he sent his love to her. Ran saw Lan fall, and it sent a spasm of anguish through him. But then he heard a voice. Let go. His father's voice. Let them sacrifice. You can't do this yourself. Ran thought about the death of Egwene and so many others. Let Go, his father told him again. It is their choice to make. Ran wanted so badly to protect them, the people who believed in him. Their debts and the danger they faced were an enormous weight upon him. How could a man just let go? Wasn't that letting go of responsibility, he thought? Or was it giving the responsibility to them? Ran squeezed his eyes shut, thinking of all those who had died for him of Egwene, whom he had sworn to protect. You fool, her voice in his head, fond but sharp. Am I not allowed to be a hero too? Let go, Rand. Let us die for what we believe and do not try to steal that from us. You have embraced your death. Embrace mine. Tears leaked from the corners of his eyes. I'm sorry, he whispered. Why? I failed. No, not yet you haven't. The Dark One flayed Rand as he huddled before the vast nothingness, unable to move, screaming in agony. And then he let go. And Rand Al Thor, the Dragon Reborn, stood up once again to face the shadow. On the field of Merilor, Loyal gave the news to Matt about how Lan had fought so bravely before he went down, taking Demon Dread with him. And it affected Matt deeply but Matt forced down his grief since that wasn't what Lan would have wanted. Instead, Matt raised his Ashendari and yelled, Taishar Malkier, with all the force he could. Lan Mandragorin, you bloody, wonderful man. You did it. Sheltering out behind him from all nationalities, all peoples, borderlander or not, and together they attacked the stunned foe. The Dark One yelled out to Rand that he could still kill that he could still take them all because he was the Lord of the Grave, that he had killed the Battle Lord and would kill them all. But Rand looked down upon the field at two bodies on the ground. Lurching, bloodied from the sword strike to his side, the last king of the Malkieri stood up. Lan thrust his hand into the air, holding by its hair the head of Demodred, general of the Shadow's armies. Matt felt the battlefield grow still. All were frozen in place as a soft but powerful sound rang out. One long tone that encompassed everything. The sound of a horn, pure and beautiful. Matt and the Borderlanders galloped southwest across the heights and came to where Lan was standing. Matt jumped from his horse and grabbed the land by the shoulder as the Malkieri king faltered. Lan looked at Matt with grim thanks and then his eyes rolled back in his head and he started to fall, dropping Demon Dread's head to the ground. After the last battle, Perrin went to Rand's healing tent at Shao Ghul and he saw Nynaeve run outside to hold Lan tightly. Lan looked as bloodied and tired as Perrin felt. Their eyes met and they nodded to one another. When Loyal showed up, he saw Lan standing by a wall wearing the crown of the Malkieri kings. A simple, silver band where the Hadori used to rest. Nynaeve wore a matching crown. The wind rose high and free to soar in an open sky with no clouds. It passed over a broken landscape scattered with corpses not yet buried. A landscape covered, at the same time, with celebrations. It tickled the branches of trees that had finally begun to put forth buds. The wind blew southward through knotted forest over shimmering plains and toward lands unexplored. This wind, it was not the ending. 
there are no endings and never will be endings to the turning of the wheel of time. But it was an ending.